October 10, 1963, From Russia With Love premiered in Europe and went on to become the top grossing film of the year at the British box office. While Dr. No had only been a modest performer in the US, From Russia With Love more than doubled its gross when released in April of 1964. By that point, production was already underway on the third James Bond film, one which would target American audiences in a blatant effort to increase the franchise's staying power in the US. And not only would they succeed, but the resulting film's success would arguably change film history forever and usher in a super spy craze that's still going strong more than half a century later. The film, of course, was Goldfinger. Now that From Rush With Love was a hit, United Artists was feeling a lot more confident in 007's staying power. Thus, they gave Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Saltzman's Ian Productions hefty $3 million budget, more than that of the previous two films combined. Connery, who was still under contract, was returning, but a pay dispute meant that the director of the first two films, Terence Young, would not be back. Instead, they hired Guy Hamilton, a veteran English director who'd cut his teeth as the second unit director under legendary John Huston on The African Queen. Eager to dig into the American market, and with Goldfinger already chosen as the next Bond film, much of the novel was jettisoned to turn this into a far more outlandish fantasy-based film than the one before it. 007. It spells... Bond. With Paul Dane and Richard Maybaum's work on the script so acclaimed that it became the unofficial model for all the Bond films, that were to follow. For the first time, a good chunk of the film would be set in North America, with the movie having early scenes in Miami, while the second half is set in Kentucky, with the famous climax at Fort Knox, albeit a distinctly cinematic version, as the real Fort Knox doesn't have gold bricks lying around everywhere and Art Deco design. No, this was courtesy of production designer Ken Adam, who just worked with Stanley Kubrick on Doctor Strangelove and was eager to strut his stuff now that they had a juicy budget. The script called for James Bond to tangle with the villainous Auric Goldfinger, a megalomaniacal villain who plots to irradiate the world's gold supply by detonating a nuclear bomb at Fort Knox. In the role, they cast acclaimed German actor Gert Frobe, despite the fact that he spoke no English. Yes, Frobe is dubbed throughout, although his size and look made him so iconic in the part. Notably, Frobe himself was far from villainous in real life. When the movie came out, it was actually originally banned in Israel due to Frobe having been a member of the Nazi party during World War II, until it was revealed that during the war he had hidden a Jewish family saving their lives, and the ban was pulled. He'd become a frequent on-screen baddie for years to come, including in Eon's own Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and eventually would learn enough English that his real voice, which was remarkably similar to that of the man who dubbed him here, Michael Collins, would be used. Arguably even more popular than the chief baddie, though, was his henchman, a first in the Bond series, with Oddjob setting the template for all those who were to follow. Harold Sakata, who was born in Hawaii and was a silver medalist in weightlifting for the American team at the 1948 Olympics, was chosen thanks to his stocky build and intimidating gaze. Note the scene where Ajab judo chops Connery in the shoulder and the look of pain on his face. Yeah, that was real. Sakata went a little too hard, but Connery liked him, so no grudges held. Oddjob's weapon of choice, of course, was a steel-brimmed hat he throws at unlucky victims and a cool statue. Sakata himself was injured during the famous electrocution scene when he held onto his hat for too long and burned his hand. Apparently, he was waiting for the director to call cut and was too much of a professional to let go. He became a favorite of kids everywhere after this and went on to a long career in commercials. Compared to the earlier films, Goldfinger was loaded with Bond girls, with Shirley Eaton's Jill Masterson famously being killed in perhaps the film's most iconic image, being covered in gold paint, which is explained as skin suffocation. She died of skin suffocation. Her sister Tilly is played by Tanya Mallet and falls victim to Oddjob's hat, while the main Bond girl is the rather infamously named Pussy Galore. My name is Pussy Galore. I must be dreaming. And yes, they thought of changing it to Kitty Galore, but they didn't. I have spotted Kitty Galore. Your mission will be revealed at HQ. This world will self-destruct. Thank God. As opposed to Dr. No and From Russia With Love, Broccoli and Saltzman actually hired a legit star, Honor Blackman, who at the time was famous for co-starring on The Avengers. She'd be replaced on the show by another future Bond girl, Diana Rigg. Overall, Goldfinger is a real classic and arguably Sean Connery's finest hour as Bond. Sporting a hairpiece for the first time, Connery is cool and collected and the imagery involved Bond is iconic from beginning to end. 
right from the moment he slips off his wetsuit to reveal a perfectly pressed white smoking jacket to him lounging around the Fountain Blue Hotel in a powder blue onesie and later spotting one of Bond's most elegant suits, this is arguably Sean Connery's finest hour as 007. Dink, say goodbye to Felix. Uh, man talk. By the time Thunderball rolled around, Bond would start to get a little bit overwhelmed by the set pieces while Connery was clearly tired of the role by You Only Live Twice and badly out of shape by Diamonds Are Forever. In fact, I'd argue that Connery is never quite as good as Bond again until all the way in 1983 when he came back for the one-off Never Say Never Again. Here though, Connery is at his absolute best. The film itself is legitimately great, running just shy of two hours with only Quantum of Solace being a shorter James Bond film. It's paced like lightning. While it's definitely a touch dated, it's also a great time capsule of the era for better or worse, and a great mix between Bond actually doing some spying coupled with off the wall action. Now, I will say this, Bond has never been a great spy. I mean, he gets caught pretty much every time he tries to infiltrate something, but then again, you know, he wouldn't be able to break out, there'd be no action, so who's complaining? <laughs> There are so many iconic moments in this film, including James Bond strapped to a table with a laser beam about to deprive him of his two best friends, and of course, the great Aston Martin chase. The screenplay again became the template for all Bonds and absolutely changed the genre in many ways. It's over the top, but also grounded with some real stakes for Bond, who seems legitimately angry when Jill Masterson is killed, although Bond's seduction of pussy galore is, well, problematic at best. I give the script a strong 8 on 10. The villains, however, are an easy 10 on 10 with both Frobes or Goldfinger and Harold Sakata's odd job being icons among icons. Who could forget this line? Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Bond girl's a bit more of a mixed bag. Shirley Eaton as Jill Masterson has the most iconic moment, but she's done away with very early. Tilly Masterson only really exists as a way to show how badass Oddjob's hat is, but I do like the fact that they show that the film's sacrificial lamb had a family and people who cared about her. It's kind of a nice touch. Blackman's pussy Glora is iconic in that she's the first tough Bond girl who can match Bond and help save the day, which would be a pattern that would get repeated quite a bit as the series went on. Anyone who feels her role is un-PC would do well to avoid Ian Fleming's novel, where she's betrayed as being gay, wanting to magically change orientations once she meets Bond, which likely would have been a lot more offensive than the final film is. Still, she isn't introduced until very late in the game, so her role does indeed feel decorative to a certain degree. I give the Bond girls about a 7 on 10. The score by John Barry, however, is one of his best, and the theme song by the great Shirley Bassey is a classic, perhaps the greatest James Bond theme song of all time, earning this category a strong 10 on 10. Funny story. Michael Caine was actually crashing with John Barry while he was writing the Goldfinger score and used to be kept awake at night by Barry pounding away on the piano. As far as gadgets go, now we're talking. This is the first decent part for Desmond Llewellyn's Q, with us not only getting our first look at his workshop, but also seeing the relationship that Q is very annoyed by Bond's cavalier treatment of his equipment. This would carry on through the series, but adopt maybe a more paternal tone once it got to the Timothy Dalton movies and to the Pierce Brosnan films. Eject to see you joking. I never joke about my work, 007. And of course, we get the greatest James Bond gadget of all time, the Aston Martin DB5. 10 on 10, people. Still my dream car. The kill count in this one is a modest nine, but it's quality, not quantity, with Bond getting some great post-mortem one-liners. But my favorite, of course, has to be the one he throws off after Goldfinger gets sucked out of an airplane window. What happened? Where's Goldfinger? Playing his golden harp. Mere words alone can't describe how huge this movie was when it came out. At the time, as far as pop culture icons went, Bond was second only to maybe the Beatles. This kicked off Bond Media, with it breaking box office records worldwide. For a while, it was in the Guinness Book of World Records as the fastest grossing film ever. Theaters in New York's Times Square had to stay open 24 hours a day around Christmas of 1964 to accommodate crowds. Just how big was this movie? If you adjust the worldwide lifetime gross of the film, it comes out to $1.3 billion. No wonder that when this hit theaters, it kicked off dozens of James Bond clones which would start to hit theaters and TV screens around the same time as the next James Bond film, Thunderball, which premiered one year later. But alas, that's a story for another time. But until then, I leave you with my Goldfinger rating, a strong 10 on 10. Some may poke holes in it and complain, but to me, it's perhaps the most iconic James Bond film of all, and a classic that can't be denied.